Hello and welcome to Americans Learn. My name is Lauren and today I'm looking at a fat electrician video. This one is uh, America dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats, aka the Barbary Wars. Um, I uh, don't know what this is. Never heard of it. Uh, didn't know it existed until I saw the video. Um, but that looks like Thomas Jefferson or somebody on the th thumbnail. So I am assuming this is early in American history based on the thumbnail. Um, I hope that y'all enjoy. I'm excited. Uh, if you want to see more stuff, make sure that you're hitting that subscribe button and that bell notification. Um, and you know, we're always looking for, for members. You can get extra content, early content, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and you can make sure that you also check out our other channels in the description box below. We've got an anime oh, yes. channel and a, uh, and a regular and another reacts channel where we react to more like gaming and things of that nature. So if you're interested in anything like that, go ahead, check that out. And in the meantime, with no further ado, let's check out this fat electrician video. Ah, yes, that time that pirates kept messing with American ships. So George Washington founded the United States Navy to do something about it. Yeah, the United States Navy was founded for the sole reason of hunting pirates. Oh. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Barbary okay. Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, it is pretty much an ongoing internet joke that you do not mess with America's boats. You know, because of Operation Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were going to sink half of Iran's navy in like eight hours. And and Vietnam, and and World War II, and World War I, and the Spanish-American War, and the War of 1812. Um, I guess if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you, this is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats. But first, a word from our sponsor, okay. because this video is brought to you by my favorite underwear company, Sheath. Wait, hold on, I'm supposed to read a script for this one. Here's how to do a perfect ad read for our company. Let's take a quick second to thank our favorite sponsor for today's show, which is Sheath Underwear. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs ever worn, and Clarence's parents have a real good marriage. This shit's fucking lame. Okay, look, here's the deal. Whether you're talking to a veteran, a construction worker, or your dad, they're all gonna tell you that there's one universal truth to life, and that truth is that cargo pockets are fucking awesome. God yes, right. they are. If you think they cargo are. shorts are cool, wait till you try cargo underwear, except the oh. cargo pocket is made with balls not being stuck to your thigh technology. And I know what you're thinking, but chubby electron guy, what if I try them out and I don't like it? Cool, just wear them like normal underwear and then you have a bonus cargo pocket. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever been like, damn it, I have too many available cargo pockets. It's never happened. That's true. Cargo shorts are not even cute at all. First of all, cargo shorts are awesome. They always have been. Second of all, you know what you and this cargo pocket have in common? You don't feel either of us? She got him. Well, at least I know who- She got him. <laughs> that was good. That was a good one. <laughs> But yeah, no, I like cargo pants. I don't know. I don't really like cargo. Sh the look of cargo shorts, really. But I can admit that they have a practical use, and I wish that my pants. I have, I have, like three pairs of cargo pants. I in like one in black, one in like olive green, and actually two in black and one in like olive green. I'm like, I will. Cargo pants are my life. I live in them. Who I'm not letting put their phone in my pocket next time we go somewhere. Anyways, if you want to try some sheath cargo underwear for yourself or buy some as a gift for your significant other, I'll have them linked in the description down below. And you can use the discount code FATELECTRICIAN for 20% off. Back to cool. the video. All right, here's the deal. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli would raid merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. So why was this allowed to go on for over 300 years? Well, the only navies powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And they all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly tribute to not raid their ships rather than go to war with them. So now those three empires aren't getting their ships raided, which is fine. That's a good thing, I guess. But here's the catch with it that they may or may not have known at the time, but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way. Now the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations. Okay. It's like Walmart, Target, and Amazon getting together, encouraging shoplifting, knowing that they can shoulder the financial burden, but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become the only ones selling goods. Except Ugh. instead of retail stores, we're talking about entire nations. This goes 
on for literally hundreds of years, but America is still part of the British Empire, so they fall under their umbrella of protection, so it's never an issue. For that now. is until the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775, with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous story of a 78-year-old veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the British Empire should get off of our lawn. Fast forward, 1783. I have seen that uh, video. It will, it's, it's very recent. It should be very recently I've seen that video in the playlist. America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country, and all of America's merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. And pretty much immediately, 1784, one of America's merchant vessels is captured by Barbary pirates from the country of Morocco. As an act of good faith for a new nation, Spain actually pays off the pirates, gets the American vessel and all of its crew back, returns it to America, and then advises the American government, hey, you guys should start paying these guys off too. That's what all Thanks, the big Spain. nations are doing. At which point, America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson chimes in and he's like, no, absolutely not. No. I'm gonna go <laughs> talk to him. Now, obviously I'm paraphrasing here, but basically Thomas Jefferson rolls up and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point the Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet that is so good at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That historically seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came to be the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan American okay. Treaty of Peace and Clever. Friendship, which is the first and longest lasting peace treaty in American history. At which point Thomas Jefferson is like, wow, that actually worked out perfect. I'm going to go to the other three Barbary states and tell them the same thing now. But of course, there's going to be a catch with that. You see, there's four Barbary states, but Morocco is the only one that's actually truly independent. And the other three are just subservient mm. branches of the Ottoman Empire. So Thomas Jefferson okay. and John Adams go to talk to the ambassador of Tripoli and they're like, hey, can all the Ottoman Barbary states leave our boats alone? At which point the ambassador informs them, absolutely not. You see, we're part of the Ottoman Empire. We don't need to listen to you. We're not scared of you guys. And it is our official stance that, and I quote, it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners who it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. You know, unless they give us money, of course. Everything's got a price, apparently. So Thomas Jefferson is like, well, okay, we're going to war then. And that's when John Adams is like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just pay the tribute so that our ships can be fine. We already disbanded the Continental Navy after winning the Revolutionary War. We don't have a Navy to fight these guys. We just have to give them the money. So that's what happened. For the next eight to 10 years, America oh, would wow. tribute every year to these three remaining Barbary states. And every year they wanted more and more money. Of and course. eventually even that wasn't enough because Algiers, I wonder if they were doing that to the other state, the other countries as well, like charging them more and more uh, with every year that went by, like, or were they just trying to take advantage of a new country? Just began attacking American vessels anyways. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that for the first time in American history, somebody has fucked with one of America's boats and they're not immediately sorry about it yet. The president at the time, George Washington, goes to Congress and pretty much tells them what's going to happen because at this point in time, George Washington is basically the king of America. Nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not. So he's like, hey, guess what? You guys are going to pass the Naval Act of 1794, establishing the United States Navy. And at the very <laughs> top of that document, okay. it very clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which is just a fancy word for state funded pirates. Yes, I'm telling you that the founding document of the most powerful Navy the world has ever seen at the top specifically states the sole reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to <laughs> fuck with one okay. of America's ships. We've officially entered the find out portion of the story. America immediately commissions the building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these pirates. Fast forward to when the frigates are done. It takes a couple years. It is now 1798 and George Washington has decided to step down from power, allowing for an election to happen. And we are now into the second president of America, John Adams. And John Adams decides he would rather keep paying tribute. Of course he does. I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked. Freaking John Adams. Not at all surprised. I was wait. I always forget that John Adams came between 
Washington and Jefferson. Um, because Jefferson, like, did more stuff. <laughs> like, Adams was like, I'm the one, I don't know what he mean. That's my impression of John Adams. America just created the Navy, spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them for their- Also, don't at me, everybody who read that book that's like that thick about John Adams and all the stuff he did. Like, <laughs> don't care. Intended purpose. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president in the next election. And one of his biggest platforms is that he is going to go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. And his slogan for this is, and I quote, millions in defense before a cent in tribute. Okay, just so we're clear, Thomas Jefferson's platform for running for president mm. is I'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense, which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point, because America no longer negotiates with terrorists. And I'm pretty sure my high school English teacher would refer to this as foreshadowing. So Tom seems like also seems like it's thomas jefferson's fault that we overspend on military and underspend on infrastructure thanks tom although whatever he's about to do right now i'm sure is going to be very very interesting and kind of badass just you know every so often we can look at what the founding fathers did in the context they did it in and be like the context is over now Let's move on from the 1700s, please, and thank you. But that's just me, maybe. Thomas Jefferson wins the election. The entire world finds out that he's going to be the third president of the United States of America. And then on March 4th, 1801, the day of his inauguration, he receives a letter from Yusuf Karmanali, the Pasha of Tripoli. If you don't know, Pasha is like the dictator, the king, the president, the, the main dude in charge. And at this point, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who just ran an entire presidential campaign on, I'm going to go fight pirates, is thinking in his head, like, maybe... This guy found out that I'm about to send a Navy over there to beat him up and he's going to send an apology. Maybe he wants to sign a peace treaty like Morocco did. This is already working out great. I might not even have to send my Navy over there. He but then he read it. And Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he is going to poke the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 in tribute. And Thomas Ooh. Jefferson is pissed. <laughs> Hell no. Ha <laughs> Uh, no. Jefferson, probably. Trying to get crazy with us. Don't you know I'm local? Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to Congress, get permission to activate the Navy, to send them over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ask for command, <laughs> and Pasha Yusuf is going to have some consequences immediately because he's oh, sending yeah. the Navy today. But like I said, it takes a literal act of Congress to send the U.S. Navy over there on a military mission, so Thomas Jefferson is like, that's fine, we just won't send them on a military mission. Fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace offerings for Pasha Yusuf, and then give it a nice, healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and he like trojan horsed them i was not expecting that send them on their merry way to deliver the gifts right after <laughs> we're gonna deliver those gifts, gifts all right the standing order that he is also to defend any american citizen or ship from any potential aggression mm. not aggression potential aggression if he thinks that somebody else might be thinking about doing something aggressive take him out, take them down. Do your yikes. Dangerous so mentality. The Navy set sail. They're gone. They're in route. Thomas Jefferson's sitting in his office and he comes to the realization, man, I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack him. But if they don't, they're actually going to end up giving Pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts. And I can't have it. So he whips no. out the old quill and parchment. And he writes a letter back and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of forever. Oh, so now he's he's going to ensure that Pasha attacks, isn't he? He's like, just in case he doesn't attack and he takes the gifts, I'm going to make sure he gets this way fast to make sure he attacks so he knows that we're not. <gasps> Ooh, the sneak. The sneak. 
F off. And obviously the letter makes it there first, at which point Pasha goes to the American consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the American flag on it, which in that part of the world is how you declare war. So the US Navy shows up off the coast of the Barbary States, the pirates attack them because they've already declared war, the US Navy defends themselves, word gets back to America, Congress then is like, oh, hey, we're at war, we're gonna go ahead and give Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. And this is why Ooh. to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the US military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. So for the next oh, years, okay. the US Navy and the Marine Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza until October. Again, it really does seem like Thomas Jefferson's like, oh, you're doing this for me just right now? Okay, I'm keeping it forever. I'm kind of surprised that TJ, didn't just like try and keep the presidency the way that he's just like, I'm gonna take this and keep it forever. And I'm gonna take this and keep it forever. And that's not even talking about the fact that he was a slave owner, but like, he's just like, mm -hmm, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna take all of these. And now it's mine for all of time, or at least it's the offices for all of time. That's also fine. October of 1803, when the USS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The pirates seize this opportunity, they attack the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage, and then over the next couple months they were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli, where they then anchored it in place and used it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they Ooh, had. Cue so our first main character, Stephen Decatur, the commander of the USS Enterprise, America's unofficial flagship. He decides was it what was that i'm sorry america's first unofficial flagship was called the uss enterprise i did not know that star trek stole that i had no clue that that was a reference to the actual that's cool that's fun information. He's going to don his plot armor, take the USS Enterprise out, yes. and acquire himself a pirate ship, which he does. He then takes that pirate ship and the USS Enterprise and sails both of them to Sicily, where he hires five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. They then sail back to Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are going to go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. They then go directly to the USS Philadelphia. 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the USS Philadelphia. They Trojan horsed it! Oh my god, brilliant. I love that. Philadelphia and reclaim it. Unfortunately, the USS Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again, at which point Stephen Decatur decides, fine, we're just going to burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it, nobody can. Deprive the enemy of nice things. I'm pretty sure Fair Sun enough. Tzu said that. So that's exactly Fair, what they probably. do. They light the USS Philadelphia on fire. They're positive it can't be put out. And then they bounce. Not a single American is injured. And Stephen Decatur is hailed a hero because he has now led what is, in my opinion, America's first special operations mission. So now yeah. that that's taken care of, the problem at hand is that the crew of the USS Philadelphia is still being held hostage by the Barbary pirates, and they want a ton of money in exchange for them back. However, America no longer negotiates with terrorists, and that's Good. not an option. Cue our next two main characters, William Eaton and Presley O'Bannon. And before you ask, yes, Presley O'Bannon, as in the USS O'Bannon, the Fletcher-class destroyer from World War II that sank a Japanese submarine with potatoes. So they go in and they pitch their idea of how they're going to get the crew. Is that a fat electrician video that I should watch? It sounds like maybe that's a fat electrician video I should watch. Crew of the USS Philadelphia back, and it is by every definition, a special operations mission. Basically, yes. they want to take themselves, cool. two dudes, plus six Marines for a total of eight guys, and they're going to get dropped off in Egypt because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. So they're going to get that guy and all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men, and then they're going to march them through the desert to Derna, where they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city. And ex this is some like Game of Thrones shit. I didn't realize this kind of thing was happening in the 1800s. Not going to lie. This seems like something that would happen more Middle Ages kind of like. Oh, that's cool. Change the city for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. And upon hearing this ridiculous plan, the US military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's awesome. A small contingency of men 
be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then convince yeah. him that you're mm -hmm. going to help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator, and basically we're using other people to fight other people that we don't like to benefit us, and and that will uh, set the, sc the store sc score for this is how America will continue to have foreign policy forever. Let's just continue getting involved in the pol politics of other countries because it might benefit us. Yay. Again, it's cool. It, like, it kind of is a fun story in like retrospect, but it's also like, this is the 1800s. Let's find a new strategy maybe Presley move on. and Eaton are like yeah that's that's pretty much exactly it and the government is like this is a terrific idea I mean we're probably never were. ever going to do anything like this ever again and we're not going to have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in it sorry any <laughs> I like it when he gets sassy <laughs> I have no idea how he actually feels about it which I think honestly just speaks to how good he is at making these videos. I've got no clue about what his personal biases are in that particular event. Mine are, we need to like stop doing that and like focus on our own issues before we keep ruining other countries. But <laughs> I just, I do find it interesting. Like he's very, very skilled at explaining a story and being a little sassy about it and i'm still not sure where he lands on the subject so i appreciate that though i like that about him anyways that's exactly what they do they get dropped off in egypt they track down Hamet. they're like hey you want to go overthrow your brother cool grab your guys let's go so let's go along the way the marines also picked up 50 greek mercenaries as they all began marching 500 miles through the libyan desert to get back to the tr <laughs> the greeks just wanted to be included <laughs> They're like, oh yeah, sure, let's go. Let's go. We're gonna have a have a little bit of a fight. Let's go have a little bit of a fight. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Politan coast. And this march through the <laughs> desert takes 50 days, and it is a complete shit show because somewhere along the way they start running low on supplies and they have to start rationing. And then some people get mad. There's accusations because the Greek guys are Christian, Hamet's guys are Muslims. There's fighting mm -hmm. amongst themselves, and there's these eight Marines standing in the middle, desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert. So despite multiple mutiny attempts and a ton of fights, the Marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it for the Libyan desert till they arrived at the coastal city of Bamba. Once they get there, they meet up with the USS Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again, and they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Then, Eaton decides that he's gonna send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door, because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay, so he sends a letter and is basically like, hey, I'm going to march my army through the middle. I love like the in ensuring they get to attack. They, like this is a like this loophole. It's like, well, we have to make them attack us. Because like I do appreciate that they're like, because like they could see anything as a potential attack. So I appreciate them writing the letter to ensure the attack. It's like manipulation is fine, I guess, sometimes. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, and again, in this particular case, and the pirates, like, yes, this is a good thing that they are doing. Like, ultimately, in this case, what their actions are, the all end goal is partly selfish, but it's also a good thing to do. You know, let's stop this terror, like, pirate terror, right? middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way to Tripoli. Um, can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds potentially aggressive enough. It does. So they begin making the plan for the ground attack. It does. Hamet and his men are going to take the governor's palace and the Marines and the Greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress. But to do that, they're going to need a cannon from the USS Argus. So they're going to meet up with it, go get this cannon and prepare for their attack. Cut okay. back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time. And oh. Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage because after he Good. captured his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of the pirate ship's captains who was oh. pretending to surrender before shooting his younger brother. Upon he Ooh, boy. This is going to be even more of a problem than taking the ship, isn't it? Hmm. That's just dishonorable. The fake surrender. That's super lame. Granted, they're pirates, so I don't know what I'm expecting, but still. 
hearing this, Decatur immediately gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with him, and takes off to track down this pirate ship that just killed his brother. So they Revenge. chase down I this pirate it. ship, they pull up right next to it, and before the crew has time to do any boarding procedures, you know, like break out the planks, tie some ropes to the other ship, all that stuff you see in the movies, nah. Stephen Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates immediately. Nine Marines, seeing that happen, are like, oh shit, we're doing this. So they <laughs> jump onto the pirate ship too and start awesome. throwing down, at which point the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship. It is now nine Marines and Stephen Decatur versus over 30 pirates on this vessel, and Doable. 30 is not going to be enough. Stephen Decatur no. kills multiple pirates, including the captain that had slain his brother, officially avenging his brother's death capturing that vessel as well but he is still absolutely furious that his brother died and he continues to go on a rampage capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks cut back to the wow. men on the ground eaten and abandoned been getting Baller. the battle plan ready this entire time they just had their men go get a cannon off the uss argus because they really really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission so they're ready to attack the u.s navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of derna while they launch this attack despite that there's over 2,000 men loyal to pasha yusuf that are going to defend it and they are heavily outnumbered so navy starts bombarding the shore hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace and eaton obannon the marines and the greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress they open up with the initial cannon fire, which is going to be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and shot that at the enemy too. Now the cannon's completely out and they're kind of like, oh shit, what do we do? What do we do? And Presley O'Bannon just charges into battle as the other Marines follow behind him and the Greek mercenaries behind them. They attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on. And wow. Presley O'Bannon becomes the first American ever to raise the Star Spangled Banner over a foreign battlefield. This battle, the taking of the Tripolitan coastal city of Derna, is enshrined in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of okay. Tripoli. Okay. I'd wondered I'd wondered where like if this is where the that is line came from in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line from the halls Like remember this I love the, I honestly this song is such a bop. <laughs> like this gets stuck in my head kind of regularly and I only ever knew the first bit, you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. That's long. like, it's just in my brain. It just lives there. It lives rent free in my head. First to fight for right and freedom. Okay. This is the part I never knew. And to keep our honor clean. I feel like I remembered learning it as like, and to keep our nation free. But like that never made sense to me because they literally just said we're fighting for right and freedom. Uh, and now, but honor clean, you know what? I feel like, I don't know. I never heard that part. I don't think let's bring that part, make that part a little bit more, uh, bring, then bring that back to the forefront. Let's bring our honor clean, make our, keep our honor clean. Let's do that. I like that. Okay. Sorry. I just got really, I was like, oh my God, I remember this. I know this song. <laughs> ...of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. And it is also where the Marine Corps would get their first nickname ever because the seven Marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the Leathernecks, referring to the leather collar that they wore around their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords. So useless wow. men end up getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to Tripoli, at which point the Marines, the Greeks, and Hamet and his men all consolidate, figure out what happened. Hamet and his men were able to take over the governor's palace and after the taking of the city of Derna, Hamet awards his very own sword to Presley O'Bannon as a gift for how valiantly he fought in battle and this is the Mameluke sword the same sword that is on the Marine Corps uniform today. So now Yusuf wow. consolidates his military, sends an enormous army back to Derna to try to take it back over and they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts of the city waiting for the right moment to attack. Eaton and O'Bannon are writing correspondence to the US military in the chain of command like hey we took this entire city with like eight marines give us some reinforcements we're gonna go take <laughs> tripoli next and then we'll just overthrow this entire country this goes on for over a month and they defend the city multiple times from attacks from yusuf's men and eventually eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave 
because American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Weird. Yusuf Carmenali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission because the deal is America is gonna pay Yusuf Carmenali, the Pirate King, $60,000 and in exchange, we are gonna receive the USS Philadelphia back as well as a peace treaty that they are gonna leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's I mean, pretty pissed okay. off about it from Thomas Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William but Eaton, Stephen De I mean, that guy had better get freaking fired. I mean, like he he brokered this peace deal, but that is, read the room, mon frere. And also like maybe they're pirates, you know, they're, can we maybe just try and purge them? They're just cause they're not gonna necessarily, just cause they say they're not going to attack American ships anymore. Like, really, you just believed them? <laughs> like, okay. Decatur, they're all furious that we are now giving $60,000 to this pirate king as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli or yeah. at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna and use that as leverage to exchange. But whatever, the war's over, I guess. For now. So the peace treaty was signed in 1805. Because like I said, like he, I, bet, I bet they do not stick to it. They're pirates. I've now fast forward seven years, 1812, the war of 1812 happens. Okay. If you don't know the war of 1812, there's more to it than this, but the reason that it started is that great Britain wanted to have more control over the seas and trade because America was getting too much because America was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too. So great Britain launches another war against America. During this war, they encouraged the Barbary pirates to start attacking American vessels again. And honestly, Britain. it works out pretty good for the pirates pirates at least for a little while because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward two years, eight months later, the War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me check my notes here. Monroe? Um, James Madison. If you Madison. don't know, James- I should have known that. Uh, Monroe's five, I think. Madison was, okay. I should have known Madison was four. I went to frickin' James Madison University. I should remember when he's president. Ugh, I'm so dumb. James Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo. And the other half is his best friend of all time. Who? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Oh yeah, the there's, there's a whole thing in Hamilton where Madison, I think it's Madison and Jefferson like they chat a lot <laughs> they're together a lot sorry but thomas jefferson hates pirates so sitting president james madison being Fair. the homie that he is looks over at now commodore stephen decatur and says go get him tiger <laughs> he then proceeds to assemble the largest u.s naval fleet ever at this point in time and sails directly to the barbary coast he then immediately tracks down algiers flagship the mashuda takes it out captures over 400 members of its crew and the ship itself. He then wow. proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port and say, here's the deal. You're gonna surrender and you're never gonna collect tribute from anyone ever again, or See? I'm gonna overthrow your entire country. Obviously they take the first option, at which point Decatur's like, okay, cool, next order of business. You're also gonna pay me back for all the US merchandise that you plundered during the war of 1812. And they're like, okay, here you go. They give it to him. He wow. He proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them the exact same thing, ordering them to sign a peace treaty oh. never an American vessel again. My and God. And collects a bunch of money. He then- How have I never heard of this guy? Sails him next door again to Tripoli and does the exact same thing. Come back. Money, gets the peace treaties. The Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again. Decatur and his fleet sail back home and he tells the government what happened. The American government is blown away at the results that Decatur was able to achieve when asked how he managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but also get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it. All Decatur said was peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point he was given the nickname the conqueror of the Barbary pirates. And with the rest of the world Fair. seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary pirates and winning, they would start <laughs> doing it too. And everybody Good. started fighting back and quit paying tribute to the Barbary pirates. And in the coming years, they would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end. So in conclusion, the moral of the story is please, for the love of God, do not mess with America's boats. Thank you. Or we might change the course of history. 
I mean, in this case, yeah, got rid of the pirates. Good job. Good job, American Navy. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Okay. He and usually that has. Is part one of the origin story of how America became the world police. Give me a hint. Part two ends after the Korean War when NATO gets founded. Oh. Okay. Good to know. I wonder if he does a video on that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but all right. So that was the Fat Electrician. America dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats. Again, make sure that you are sending love to the Fat Electrician. You know, and I, I got a little bit, I have some opinions about how we do stuff, especially with our military. I know. Um, in this case, I feel like it was fairly well done. But again, I, I you know, it's hard to be on the side of the pirates in this particular instance, you know, um, cause ultimately they get their fun. Pirates are fun to have stories about and like fun to like romanticize a little bit, but the actual reality of piracy was pretty brutal and awful. So, um, there's that, but anyway, uh, thank you all for watching. I do hope you enjoyed and let me know what I should react to next in the comments below. Um, and I will see you in the next one.